Israel appears to be planning a major offensive into the southern Gaza city of Rafah in the United States is kind of done pushing back. It looks like they're just ready for this to go forward, which raises the question that I have for you. If you're in favor of a ceasefire in this war, which presidential candidate do you think is more likely, U.S. presidential candidate, Trump or Biden, is more likely to bring that about? I don't know. I'm going to get more into that in a second, but interested in your feedback on that topic. We've got a tragic story of a six-year-old Palestinian girl that was killed as she and her family attempted to flee northern Gaza, and new footage of Hamas leader Yahya Sinwar in the tunnel networks under Khan Yunus. It's a lot to get into, so I'm glad you're here. I'm recording this at 8.30 a.m. Central on Wednesday, February 14th, 2024. Starting with operations on the ground, most of the focus right now is eyeing a potential Israeli offensive into Rafah. This is the southern portion of the Gaza Strip and one of the areas where the IDF has yet to really operate since the ground portion of this war kicked off. Most of the fighting, the house-to-house, room-to-room, tunnel-to-tunnel, is taking place in Khan Yunus right now. That is still relatively the southern portion of the Gaza Strip. Rafa is even further south than that, and there are a lot of civilians down there. Again, it's the last area that the IDF has yet to push into, which means that all of the civilians from northern, central, and the northern half of the southern portion of the Gaza Strip have all been moved down to Rafah over the course of the last couple months. So there were some interesting comments put out by the IDF chief of staff yesterday that I thought were worth running through. He talks a little bit about progress so far in this war as well as what to expect going forward. He said, quote, we have so far eliminated over 10,000 terrorists, including many commanders. This is what it means to dismantle Hamas. That is a major question. What does the dismantlement, the, the elimination of Hamas actually look like? That is probably the easiest metric to gauge. Somebody was a Hamas militant yesterday. They're killed. That's one less Hamas fighter. Uh, and that is a portion of this. If, if Israel plans to, as they continually say, uh, eliminate Hamas, destroy their military capabilities, a major portion of that is going to be killing Hamas militants. It is not the only thing. Uh, but, you know, as per the IDF chief here, he says that 10,000 have so far been killed. He said, quote, if we do not continue to attack Hamas with determination, it will be very difficult to end the war and return the hostages, which I think this is something that's kind of gone, uh, it's missed a lot in different coverage. I think a lot of the coverage around the return of hostages is either or. It's either a military operation or it's a ceasefire negotiations. And I think what's missing a lot of times is the recognition that the reason that Hamas is willing to negotiate in many cases is due to the military pressure. So they're not mutually exclusive And it's entirely likely that Israel has been able to bring home the hostages that they have so far through the ceasefire negotiations um, because of the pressure that they have placed militarily on Hamas. Those two items in a perfect world work side by side. In talking about Rafah, he said, quote, we have plans and we will choose the right time to carry them out and, of course, the right way. He said, we know that it is difficult for us to fight in an environment where there are over a million people and another 10,000 Hamas operatives. He said, in a previous part of the war, we sought to isolate the population. We have the capabilities to do it. We did it in Gaza City. We did it in Khan Yunus. We did it in the central camps. I am saying here that the residents of Rafah will be allowed to evacuate the area. It is not right for the citizens, for the residents, for the families to be in the area of fighting. When will it happen? How will it happen? We will decide when the time comes, he adds. This is getting increasingly tricky because when you are up in the northern portion of the Gaza Strip, you could push people south. And even then... It was kind of compressing a lot of civilians into a small area. And then as Israel moved into the southern portion of the Strip and did not permit civilians to move back into the north because it was still an active war zone, uh, you know, you had the full Gaza Strip pushed down into a third of the area. It's getting smaller and smaller. So Rafah is very densely packed right now. There's been some rumors about what potential civilian evacuation might look like. Some of those include Palestinians going into Egypt, um, but it doesn't sound like anybody except Israel is on board with that plan. It sounds like Egypt is very much against that. So again, when looking at Rafa and operations on the ground, it a lot of signs that it could be coming in the near term here. Now, another major player, of course, in all of this is the United States. And there's been some debate about whether or not Biden and the U.S. administration should push back on this Israeli operation to Rafa, given the density of civilians in that area. And there's a new article in Politico titled, U.S. Won't Punish Israel for Rafa Op That Doesn't Protect Civilians. And there's a couple parts to this that I thought were worth talking through. First off, right out the gate, it says the Biden administration is not planning to punish Israel if it launches a military campaign in Rafah without ensuring civilian safety. No military in history, past or present, has the ability 
to ensure civilian safety in a war zone. We can't do it. The United States, it's, that is not a realistic ask of any fighting force ever throughout history. A military can and should do what they can to limit and mitigate civilian casualties uh, and ensure civilian safety to the best of their ability, but it is not something that can be guaranteed ever. So I think that might frame this uh, in a way that isn't necessarily accurate. It's on Israel, whether it's in Rafah or any other portion of the Gaza Strip or wherever they're fighting, to do their best to prevent civilian casualties. Um, but what we have, the, the other takeaway that I have here is that the United States is just kind of like, go for it. They're kind of, kind of hands off with Israel in a lot of sense. And, and I want to get more into this in a second. But uh, John Kirby, the national security spokesperson, uh, would not respond to a question about what the United States would do if the Rafah offer operation went forward without any concern for civilian safety. So again, worded a little bit differently there. But the way this one was phrased is what if Israel goes in and just doesn't care about the civilians and is killing everybody? He says, quote, I'm not going to get into a hypothetical game. It's kind of what we get with these politicians uh, or government officials, very political type speech. Uh, same from State Department spokesperson Matthew Miller. He was asked what the what leverage the United States had used to influence Israel on this Rafa decision. And he said, quote, we have seen the government of Israel respond to it, not always in the way we want, not always to the degree that we want or to the level that we want, but our interventions, we believe, have had an impact and we will continue to pursue them. By and large, now the, the source here saying that the United States is not going to pressure Israel any further come from unnamed sources for, you know, speaking on the condition of anonymity. Take that for what it's worth. But it kind of matches with the rest of the war so far. There's been very few cases where the U.S. has really put their foot down and from what I can tell, at least, directly influenced how Israel pursues the war going forward. Which leads to another question that I'm very interested in your feedback on. Which presidential candidate here in the United States do you think is most likely to pursue a ceasefire in Gaza? The reason I ask that, I've been thinking about this a lot, but in so many polls, it's greater than 50% of American respondents say they support a ceasefire in Gaza. But when you look at the political support, it's not really in that direction. So if, if, if you fit that criteria, if you're an American getting ready to vote here in a few months, and the top priority for you, the thing that you're going to the polls for has to do with the ongoing war in Gaza, and you support a ceasefire, what's the move there? Um, just fr from my perspective, and the reason I'm asking is it seems very much like Trump, Biden, RFK, any other candidates, they're all kind of two sides of the same coin when it comes to their support for Israel, broadly speaking, and the war more specifically. I, I Again, there's, there's a segment of the population that supports a ceasefire. I'm not sure where that's represented in the coming election. This isn't a trick or to try to say, I got you or anything like that. I'm genuinely interested in, if that is your top priority, what is your move for this coming election cycle? It just... It's interesting to me. It seems like it's one of those things that is, it's very important to a segment of the population, but it doesn't seem like it's reflected hardly at all in our national politics. So uh, looking forward to the feedback there. Let me know what you think. Then we've got a tragic story of a six-year-old Palestinian girl that was killed while she and her family attempted to flee northern Gaza uh, amidst the ongoing war between the IDF and Hamas. So the information we have right now is that Hind Rajab, a six-year-old Palestinian girl, uh, and two rescuers that went looking for nearly two weeks ago were found dead this past Saturday. That's according to the Palestinian Red Crescent. Hind was supposedly fleeing the car, uh, fleeing the city in a car with her aunt, uncle, and three cousins. What it sounds like happened, because there were phone calls that the Red Crescent recorded and have now made public, uh, sounds like they were trying to exit this area. They came under fire. The car was shot up or hit with shrapnel, something of the two, and a lot of the people, all, all of the people in the car except for Hind were killed. And she's talking to the people at the Red Crescent saying, come get me. I'm scared. I don't know what to do. I'm scared of the dark. Um, and they tried to coordinate an evacuation for this one girl, this one six-year-old girl, tried to go in and get her. Uh, it, it sounds like, according to the Red Crescent, they said, we got the coordination. We got the green light. On arrival, the crew confirmed, the evacuation crew, the ambulance uh, that they could see the car was where, where Hind was trapped, and they could see her. The last thing we heard is continuous gunfire, and the communications went out with that rescue crew. And then a Red Crescent statement on Saturday accused Israeli forces of bombing the ambulance as it arrived just meters away from the vehicle containing the trapped child and killing the two rescuers inside. It said this happened despite prior coordination between the Red Crescent and the Israeli military. Uh, a minor piece to pick apart here, but I think it's going to end up being kind of important. 
uh, bombing or shot up or destroyed, rocket, anything destroyed. The pictures of the ambulance are destroyed. I wouldn't take that to necessarily mean that an aircraft overhead followed this ambulance and dropped a bomb at this specific time, just that it was destroyed by some, some element in the area. Haven't seen anything uh, quite yet released from Israel on this front. The U.S. Uh, was pressed on this and said that they have asked Israel to investigate uh, with the utmost urgency. But either way, whatever the investigation ends up turning up or how this plays out, the, I think the, the bottom line here is another, another civilian killed, another, another group of civilians killed. Uh, in this case, a picture that we can share showing the six-year-old girl, Hin Rajab, uh, killed alongside six of her family members uh, and a couple rescuers just a few days ago. Then we've got new footage showing Hamas leader Yahya Sinwar in a tunnel in southern Gaza's Khan Yunus. I'll go ahead and play the footage here. Uh, Israel says that this footage from a security camera inside of the tunnels uh, that they were able to recover is dated October 10th, so three days after the attack took place into Israeli territory. In the footage, uh, we have Ibrahim Sinwar, uh, Yahya Sinwar's brother. He's leading Sinwar along with his wife and children through this tunnel passage. Uh, IDF says that earlier this month, they were able to detain quite a few close relatives of senior Hamas commanders and have been able to gather pretty significant intelligence from them about the movements and current locations of some of the Hamas leadership. Uh, and then a separate video, IDF soldiers moved down into this tunnel network. So it's not just that they recovered the security footage, uh, but they're now in possession and have cleared large portions of the tunnel where Sinwar was, was seen. Again, a couple months old video. Uh, in this video, they show that it's a pretty extensive tunnel network, pretty nice, um, which leads people to believe that it was likely used by Hamas leadership and wasn't just an area to transition weapons from one firing point to another. The video showed uh, a couple different bathrooms in this tunnel network, a well-stocked kitchen, an area to sleep, and a separate room, which the IDF said belonged to Sinwar himself, which they say they found a safe uh, filled with millions of shekels and U.S. dollars. Now, I'm sure the question will come up, uh, how on earth does the IDF have security camera footage from inside some of these Hamas tunnels? And the short answer is that it is very, very hard to sanitize an area on the battlefield as you're leaving that location. So in some cases, the, the, the last couple people responsible for maybe wiping hard drives, destroying uh, computers, things like that, they might be killed. And then they can't destroy the thing before the IDF gets in there. In other cases, they might have to leave so fast or they're not able to get back into the location. Either way, just it's not crazy in any war, in any conflict. This is regular. You move into an area, there's always going to be something left behind. I would expect that Hamas has wiped the majority of this security footage. Uh, I would imagine that they have destroyed the majority of the hard drives and laptops and the computers that are left behind. Um, but IDF is still going to get their hands on a handful. And just given how much of Gaza they moved through at this point, it's not surprising at the least, in the least, that they are starting to see and we're starting to have released publicly uh, security camera footage from inside of the Hamas tunnels. But that's all I got for now. Of course, if interested in this or other national security subjects, be sure to check out my Substack, which is linked in the description below. We just put out an article today talking about the West Papua insurgency, which is pretty timely given that Indonesia is going to the polls today to elect a leader that in some way, shape or form is going to have to deal with that. It's a pretty wild one. Uh, it's free. Again, if interested, linked in the description below. But thanks for watching and I'll see you all next time.